stars. So stars are pulsating, that means that they somehow move, I mean, in the surface structure, they move, some parts are moving out, some parts are moving in at the same time. And a special case of pulsations are the radial pulsations when the star is just swelling past its uh, equilibrium state and back, so it's expanding and contracting, but it maintains its spherical shape. But this is a special case. Normally, stars uh, perform non-radial pulsations, so some parts of the star move out, some other parts move in at the same time. And we describe pulsations by three parameters, the so-called quantum numbers of the pulsations. So we first have a radial order n, we have a degree L, and we have an azimuthal number m. The degree L gives us the number of node lines on the stellar surface. And a node line is a line on the surface that does not perform any radial movement, so it's fixed. And uh, the azimuthal number, uh, the absolute value of that value m can be 2L plus 1, so it uh, goes from minus 2L plus 1 until plus 2L plus 1, and that number indicates how many of these node lines lie in merid meridional direction. That means how many of these lines go through the poles. And if we have modes with m equals a non-equal to zero, then that means that we have waves that are traveling around the stellar surface, and depending on whether it's positive or negative, they travel in one or in the other direction. To show you some example how that may look like, I uh, have here a picture that shows you three different modes for stars under different inclination angles. So here it's shown the edge on view, and here it's shown the pole on view, and here is some intermediate angle. And in the top row, we have the, the mode with LM equals 5, 0. 5 means that we have five nodal lines, and M is zero means that none of them goes through the pole. So all of them must be parallel to the equator. That you can see here, these white lines, these are the fixed, they don't move, the fixed lines. And you see the blue parts of the stellar surface, they are going, uh, they are coming towards us and the red parts, they move away. So they move inside and the other parts move outside. <coughs> we have here LM is five, two. So two of these nodal lines go through the poles. You can see that here better or on the pole on, and the other three are parallel to the equator. And if uh, L equals M equals 5, we have here, it looks like an orange, so all of the nodal lines go through the pole, and we have this kind of shape. Then the third quantum number, as I said, the N value, it uh, defines the nodal surfaces inside the star, so they are according to the radial direction, so we can have surfaces inside the star that do not move. They are fixed. So we have here the convective core of a star, we have some ionization zones, and we have here node lines. And you see the movement is from one side and from the other side. And this line, this surface, is fixed in space. Of course, at the surface of the star, nothing is fixed, so the surface can move out. So this is not a node line. And we call the oscillation modes with n equals zero, the fundamental mode, and then we have the overtones, first overtone and second overtone, etc. So this is how we classify different position modes. And uh, escape. escape. To show you a little bit more um, demonstration how the star surface of the star is then behaving, and this is highly exaggerated, of course, but you can see how crazy a star, the surface of a star can be moving. And these stars are definitely not spherically symmetric anymore. So we have here different examples, a dipole mode, L equals one, M zero. It, it seems that the star is jumping up and down in space, but that's not true. The equatorial, the equator of the star is fixed and just the rest is moving up and down. So you can see they can have quite funny structures, depending on, on the mode. And the higher the mode, the more funny it looks like. Um, here on PDF, and control L. <coughs> you are back. 
There are basically two common types of modes that we distinguish, uh, and they depend, uh, they depend on the physics that is uh, causing the, the restoring force. So on one hand we have the P modes, <coughs> which are the pressure modes, and they are connected with uh, sound waves inside the star. So the restoring force here is the pressure. And uh, that means, of course, that uh, since uh, the sound, uh, sound speed is very sensitive to temperature and chemical composition, that with these modes we are able to probe the internal temperature structure and chemical composition of the star. The periods of these P modes are typically in the range of hours to about a day. And then we have the G modes, which are the gravity modes. So in that case, the restoring force is the gravity or the buoyancy. And uh, these modes probe the gradient region of the mean molecular weight. So they are very useful because with them we can probe the chemical transfer mechanism inside the star caused by different physical mechanisms such as differential rotation. The periods are much longer, so they are in the range 1 to 10 days. So if we see a pulsation period of a star, we can say immediately whether it's a P mode or whether it's a G mode. This is uh, to show you uh, how the modes propagate inside the star. This is uh, an example for a solar type star. We know that the sun has a radiative core and uh, it is expected that inside this core the G modes are excited, but they cannot propagate to the surface of the star. So we cannot see these G modes. So for the sun, we only see the P modes and they are uh, excited and they propagate on the surface and they penetrate up to some, some depth, depending on the acoustic ray path of this mode, and then they are reflected back to the surface. In massive stars, the situation is more complicated or it's different, because there we have convective cores, convective shells, and radiative zones, etc. So, when we have uh, pulsations, the big question is what drives these pulsations? And uh, it is uh, the so-called kappa mechanism that is responsible for the excitation and the maintenance of these uh, <coughs> pulsations. And uh, to explain how this kappa mechanism is working, it's very simple. We have uh, ionization layers of hydrogen, of helium somewhere inside the star. And of course, these uh, layers uh, have a certain opacity and this opacity can block the radiation that is coming from uh, shells that lie below that. But if the, uh, the radiation cannot penetrate anymore, it is blocked, so that means it starts to heat, it starts to build up a pressure, and this pressure then causes the star or this shell to move upwards. And also, not only to move upwards, but also the material will ionize. But if the material is ionized, the opacity drops immediately. So the radiation can pass through, the pressure decreases, and uh, the shell is falling back. So we have, when it's falling back, of course, it starts again to recombine, it cools, and the whole scenario starts all over again. So we have this kind of movement. It is initiated and it's maintained, and this causes these pulsations to propagate throughout the star. And this is what is called in the literature a heat engine. The, the size and the position of these ionization zones very much depend on the effective temperature of the star. And that means that, uh, of course, uh, if the star is a little hotter or a little cooler, maybe it is not able to pulsate anymore. And uh, also, pulsations cannot propagate if this ionization zone is either too close to the surface or too close to the convective core or, or some convection zone because then the, the waves are immediately damped out and they cannot build up and remain stable. And that's why when we look at the Hirschsprung-Wasser diagram, here's the main sequence and here the evolutionary path and all these shaded regions are instability domains, nowadays known instability domains. Then it's also clear that stars that are pulsating, they are located around certain regions. And if the star, for instance, here evolves, then the conditions inside 
change, these ionization zones change, their position changes, the temperature of the star changes, and the position just stops. It cannot be maintained anymore. So that's why we have many different position zones where stars, the positions are very stable, but if the star is moving out or in, or on either side of these uh, zones, then the positions will stop. Now I said that I would like to talk about positions in B supergiants, and when we look in this search for muscle diagram, the location where these stars are, there is no uh, instability domain indicated. So how would that be possible? Also, these stars are known to have line-driven winds. It was uh, recently found that these winds are heavily clumped. These are all things that um, make this star very different from all the other stars on the HR diagram. And in addition, as soon as the star, a massive star, evolves off the main sequence and expands, it has a very condensed radiative helium core. So all the pulsation modes that are traveling from the surface towards the core, they are immediately damped. They cannot return back to the surface. So there is no way to uh, install stable pulsation modes. So these stars are not expected to pulsate at all. Were not expected. Let me correct that. So it was thought that these stars are very well behaved and nobody needs to care about them. They are blue supergiants, they sit there on the sky and do nothing, just shine and be happy. But that's not true because uh, these stars are known to have a very strong light curve and line profile variability. And in some works of Kaufreda in the late 90s, he demonstrated for one star here the light curve, which is very, very variable, very chaotic variable, not really regular. And also that uh, here the H alpha line, for instance, is very variable. When we look here at the dynamical plot, it's plotted uh, with in, as a function of time and velocity. We see that the uh, emission changes in strength with time and also the absorption, and sometimes the second absorption forms, etc. And then he also investigated uh, a set of uh, late B, early A type supergiants, which are now called uh, uh, alpha Cygni variables. And he found that they show quite long quasi periodic variability with periods between about, let's say, 3 and 50 days. Another nasty thing about these stars is that their line profiles are very, very broad and much broader than is what is usually expected from normal rotational broadening. I mean, the main broadening mechanism in uh, massive stars is rotation. But if you try to fit a line profile, and here it's plotted, um, well, you cannot distinguish. There are two lines on top of each other under the solid line. But if you have an observed line profile and you just fit it with a rotationally broadened one, this fit badly fails. So you cannot reproduce the shape of the line profile with just a rotationally broadened line. It looks more like a Gaussian profile. So people thought these stars have what is called in literature some macro turbulence. So some very whatever kind of velocity that is making these lines much broader than what is expected from pure rotation. So now it was expected or, or suspected that uh, both the line profile variability and the macro turbulence together, they might indicate something like pulsations. And in fact, the first B supergiant that was found to be pulsating was observed, oops, was observed with photometry. So, and that was done with the MOST satellite. So we have here the light curve over a certain period, continuous monitoring with photometry. And this is the target star, and here is the comparison standard star. And you see quite clearly that there is a lot of variability going on in that light curve. And this is a, a zoom in into a very tiny region here. And by analyzing this light curve, Sayu et al. found that this star presents 48 different periods, and they range from about 10 hours to 25 days. And this line in red is the combined fit of all these 48 periods to the observed light curve. When we want to understand now how is that possible that this star is pulsating with so many different periods, uh, Sayo et al. started to compute 
the stellar evolution of massive stars, uh, including pulsation. So how, what kind of pulsations can be expected as a function of temperature uh, for different massive, uh, different stars of different initial mass? And he found, quite surprisingly, that uh, here, for the higher mass stars, there's a lot of p modes generated at some certain temperature, let's say here, and also a lot of g modes at the same time. And when you locate this star in the Hirschsprung-Russell diagram, it has, of course, some uncertainty in temperature and luminosity. This is roughly where it is located. And he finds from his modeling that stars, massive stars on the main sequence, are pulsating in pure P modes. When they are very evolved, they pulsate in pure G modes. And somewhere in between, they can have both types of pulsations. But I said that stars do not pulsate, these type of stars. So how is it possible? The answer is very simple. It happened only that uh, Sayo et al. took the new opacity tables provided by OPAL and just inserting these new highly updated opacity tables, suddenly the stars were able to pulsate, which was not possible with the old opacity tables. So that was the only secret. So it is nothing special about these stars. They just can pulsate as other stars as well. And this pulsation is uh, related uh, to the presence of an intermediate convection zone or convective zone connected with the hydrogen burning shell that forms after the main sequence. So if you have any uh, GMOs that are excited, then they are reflected at this convective zone. They do not propagate until the core where they are damped, but they are reflected back and then they can perform stable pulsations. And it's the same mechanism, it's the kappa mechanism that is uh, initiating the pulsations and maintaining, but it's not only hydrogen and helium, but it's mainly the, the iron elements that are responsible for the mechanism. And what is quite important is that the occurrence of such an intermediate convection, convection zone is extremely sensitive to the past history of the star. It results from some semi-convection episode during the main sequence, so if we see an evolved massive star pulsating, then we know it has such a zone and that during the main sequence it must have had a an episode where it performed semi-convection. Of course, uh, whether this, forms, then this zone forms uh, is also influenced by many other parameters such as rotation, mixing, presence of magnetic fields, strong mass loss, and overshooting. So people started to investigate the influence, for example, of uh, mass loss on the presence of pulsations. And it was very interesting that for stars with no mass loss, the post-mass sequence evolutionary stars can pulsate down to rather low initial masses. You see here P modes and G modes can be excited. This box is uh, where this pulsating B supergiant star is located with its error bar. And you see that if a star has a mass loss rate of about 10 to the minus 7 um, solar masses per year, then this all shifts up. So you do not find stars below 16 solar masses that would uh, be able to uh, excite pulsations in their post-main sequence evolutionary state. So the mass loss is a very important parameter. And this was uh, shown by Godard in 2009. Um, then the other parameter, as I was mentioning, is uh, the overshooting during the main sequence. Overshooting is still something that is not very well understood and it's usually parametrized by some parameter alpha and depending on the value of alpha, the evolution of the star can be different and you see that for increased alpha values, the extent of the main sequence evolution goes to much cooler temperatures. So when we compare the position of this pulsating B supergiant with these new models, then we must even raise the question, is this star already a supergiant or is it maybe still on the main sequence? So the, the major, uh, how to say, it is very important for us to study these type of stars because if we find and we are able to identify the pulsation modes in these objects, then it, we will be able to study 
the internal structure of the star, but also the evolutionary history of the star. But what will we do if we do not have access to these fancy satellites or if we do not have access to uh, ground-based photometric uh, facilities that allows us to take a lot of uh, time series? Then we can also use spectroscopic observations and that's what we are doing in Montreal because pulsating stars display uh, line profile variability which uh, uh, reflect the positional activity of the star. And here I would like to show um, an example or a few examples of how that may look like. So we have here a star in the radial mode and you see here how the line wiggles around the equilibrium state. And if you have higher modes, especially higher degree modes, you see how asymmetric the line profiles can look like. So they look, they have different, many absorption components. So it's a, a quite complicated uh, profile structure, but the profiles are not normal anymore. They are not just pure Gaussian profiles anymore. So by studying these type of uh, um, Line profile variability, we will be able to find pulsations also from spectroscopy. And that we can do by taking time series, and this is here also shown for three different modes. And when you see uh, how the uh, asymmetry is propagating through the line profile with time. And to analyze these line profiles, we make use of the so called moment method. So when we have a line profile, we normalize our data, so the continuum is at 1, and our flux is smaller than 1, so we compute the higher moments of the line profile, which is just a, sort of a weighted integration over the line profile, and then we make use of these different uh, moments. Most important is the first moment, which gives us the, the radial velocity of the line, or the center of gravity, the second one gives an indication for the line width, but the third one, which is also very important, it shows the skewness, the asymmetry of the line. If you have a symmetric line, this is always zero. As soon as the line is uh, asymmetric, you will see that immediately in the third moment of the line. So it's very important to study these moments. Here is shown an example of the three moments, the first, second and third. These are uh, theoretical calculations. Um, for a mode with L equals 2 and shown are here the different line styles the solid line here let's start here with the first moment solid line is for M equals 0 this is an axisymmetric mode then we have uh, the dashed line is uh, for M equals 1 and these diamonds are for M equals 2 so this is the first, second and third and what is very important when you compare the first and the third, you see these moments vary always in phase. And this is a very, very strong indication that the line profile variability is caused by pulsations and nothing else. Also, if it's possible to have a good signal of the second uh, moment, then we can immediately distinguish between uh, sectoral modes and axisymmetric modes. Because the axisymmetric mode for M equals zero, which is the solid line, it shows twice the frequency than uh, the others. And uh, yeah, so they can easily be distinguished. So coming to the work that we are doing in Montreal, uh, this is sort of a hot top list of stars that we are following, that we are monitoring. Um, they are selected because uh, they are all rather bright, so even with not so good weather conditions we can observe with a relatively good signal-to-noise outcome. I plotted them here in the HR diagram and you see these are the boundaries of the new instability domains computed by Sayo et al. All of them fall in except of one, and this one is the one I would like to start with because my student is working on this star. And uh, its name is Sigma Cyclos, and we selected or 
grabbed the set of parameters that were known from the literature. And you see already here, we have a V sin i and a macro turbulence of equal size. So you see strong indication that this star might be pulsating because this value is pretty high. The star has a very strong uh, CNO surface abundance uh, enrichment that uh, indicates that the star is evolved. And as I said, it is outside, a little outside of this new instability domain. So we observed it with the Perectometer Telescope since August 2009. We have a total of 106 spectra in the H-alpha region, distributed over 33 nights. And during four nights, three of them were consecutive, and the fourth one was uh, um, displayed, um, offset by about 19 months. We have uh, time taken time series. The spectral resolution on GEOF is not the best, but uh, we could uh, obtain very good signal-to-noise spectra. And in addition, we have collected at DAO in Canada uh, another set of 294 spectra in each alpha region over five consecutive nights in September 2012 with a much better resolution, but uh, the signal to noise is not so good. Let's start with the um, Andreev data. Uh, as I said, we take over long, long time period, we take uh, observations, and if the conditions are good enough, we take time series within each night. So these are the long-term variations. <laughs> So first, we computed a mean profile for the different lights of silicon, each alpha and helium-1. And these are the, it's the black line. And then we compare the offset of uh, individual dates, how the line profile varies. I mean, for the silicon lines, there you see there is, for here, for instance, there's a shift in the profile here also. And uh, the strongest variability is in each alpha. But when we analyzed, uh, when we looked just at uh, the data from one night, which had a very high quality, so this is uh, uh, a total observing time of about 2.5 hours. Each spectrum had about four minute exposure time. Then you can see already here, just by looking, from looking by eye, that uh, some sort of wave is going through this line profile. And actually through the other line profiles as well. It's not limited to one element. So we started to analyze, we made the moment analysis, we computed uh, the first moment and we found the periodic signal, we phased the data and we found a period of about 1.6 hours, which is very, very, very short compared to what is predicted from theory. But we see that the first and the third moment, they were in phase, and still there is some scatter, but uh, we see that they were in phase, so this is the strongest indication that these are due to pulsations. The second moment is sometimes very difficult, it's affected by noise and it's, it's hard to say what kind of mode it is. From the DAO data that had worse quality, but still we could see there's a lot of variation going on within one night. Here you can see first moment, third moment, again they vary in phase, but the data were not good enough to perform a better analysis. So all we found are two suspicious periods. Both have about one, one, one day, so it's uh, maybe due to aliases. We have to confirm uh, or deny these two periods. But it's also clear from the Andreev data there must be more positional periods uh, inside this star. Now, facts and curiosities about that star is that it has a very enriched surface abundance in nitrogen and helium. And from spectroscopy, people obtained a current mass of the star of only eight solar masses. But when you look, the initial mass should have been something between 12 and 15. So it must have lost a lot of material already. And that could indicate that the star is very evolved. It's not just beyond the main sequence, but this star might be evolving back, backwards to the blue. And uh, Sayo made uh, new calculations uh, following the evolution of massive stars, even following the evolution backwards to the blue side. And he found very surprisingly that when the star is evolving backwards, it has many more pulsations than when it's evolving to the red. And the, the reason for that is that the star has lost a lot of material, which is shown here. The initial mass of the mass of the star, when you start with a 25 solar mass star, and then at the end of its, 
on its backward evolution, it has only 10 solar masses left. So for our star, which started with about 15, when it's evolving back, it has something like 8, which is observed. It has 8 solar masses, it is an evolved star, and it should display many more position modes than the three that we found so far. Now coming to uh, the main part of the talk, or the main subject of the talk, uh, positions as a massless checker in P-type supergiants or in evolved massive stars in general. Uh, as I said, there are two types of, uh, of modes, and for the evolved massive stars, uh, Sayoidal predicted that only the G modes uh, should be excited with periods of a few days. But there is also this hypothesis that uh, strange modes can be excited as well. They are, they are weird, as the name says, they are strange. They have a completely different behavior than uh, the known P and G modes. Uh, and they can have periods between 10 and 100 days. So they are predicted from theory so far. But they can be both radial and non-radial. And they are supposed to, uh, well, it's uh, supposed that these modes are trapped in a cavity caused by some density inversion in the outer non adiabatic envelope of stars that have a very high luminosity over mass ratio, which would exactly fit to stars that come back uh, from the red evolution. So when they lost a lot of mass uh, during a red supergiant stage, then they keep the luminosity, but the mass went down, so this ratio goes up. And then these, are, these stars are suitable to excite this so-called strange mode. And they have been suggested to be the cause for the LBV eruptions or LBV mass loss phases. But there was uh, so far no observational proof for the real occurrence of these strange modes. Until 2010, when Connie Arts and her collaborators they investigated a B supergiant, a very luminous B supergiant with Coro, one of the satellites taking photometric observations. So they had a, a light curve, and in addition, they had higher resolution spectroscopy, um, sort of simultaneous, but not really, and only sporadic spectroscopy, while we had a, they had a almost 140 days coverage of photometry. And they found that uh, this photometric light curve is very variable, and we have a sudden jump by a factor of 1.6. And they also saw from the spectroscopy that the line profiles, they vary quite crazily. You can see that uh, for the, the Balmer lines, and I think this is a helium line. So they suggested that maybe this star may be undergoing strange mode pulsations, and from the variability, especially in the Balmer lines, that are also strong indicators for wind, um, they suggest that uh, the wind is sort of triggered by this strange mode position or by this jump here in photometric data that they saw. Um, what we are doing is, uh, well, of course, we try to search for all kinds of position modes, and uh, now I would like to talk about my favorite star, this work that is in, uh, in progress. It's 55 Cygni, it's located here in the HR diagram. Uh, this is a list of stellar parameters taken from the literature. You see here the macro turbulent velocity is almost twice as high as the predicted Vsi value. And uh, the star has a, a stellar wind. And uh, usually the wind parameters of these stars, they are uh, determined from fitting line profiles, in particular from fitting the emission component of H alpha. And when you look in the literature, when you search what people determined, I put here only the list of, uh, of one set of observations. When you look for the wind parameters, you see every paper gives different values. And you think, how is that possible? But they don't discuss, they don't say, oh, these other investigators, they obtain these parameters and the difference between them and ours is this, no. But when you look carefully, you see that in every paper, the line profile of H alpha is different. So it is not surprising that every investigator finds different values for the wind parameters. And surprisingly, when we started to observe, we also found that in every night, H alpha looked different. So it is not a surprise that when you have a different profile from different nights, 
that you obtain different values for the wind. And here is just a, an example. It's a selection of how these stars can vary in H alpha. So if you study this line profile or if you study this line profile, you will obtain completely different results, of course. So it shows sometimes specific profile, pure emission, almost nothing, double, multiple peak. This star is just crazy. So we observed that uh, also in H alpha region with uh, the MJF telescope. This is uh, an example spectrum that is the coverage that we have. We have also, we have here this very strong helium line that we will analyze. We have here two strong carbon lines, H alpha, nitrogen, and silicon two lines, etc. And we analyze basically with respect to the wind. Of course, we want to fit uh, all, the, all the lines and obtain the, the wind parameters from each profile. We do that by using the code fast wind from Pulse et al. It's a spherical symmetric stationary stellar atmosphere code. Uh, the photosphere is uh, treated in hydrostatic equilibrium and the wind velocity is, is described by the typical beta law. And uh, the stellar parameters and the wind parameters, they are obtained from fitting the profiles of photospheric lines, like those ones, and H alpha. This is an example of H alpha line profile from four consecutive nights in uh, September 2010. So the line profile changed quite a lot. And not only the line profile, also the parameters that we find. So the mass loss range is here uh, 0.24, here is 0.15. It's almost a factor two, here is 0.3. It's almost a factor of two in mass loss rate from night to night, and also the terminal velocity changed quite dramatically. In total, we had uh, 339 observations distributed over 59 nights from August 2009 until, until August 2013. Uh, quite a lot of uh, spectra have very good signal to noise ratio. And this is, this is an older one, now we have a, maybe a better plot for that, but what we find is that the mass loss rate scales with the terminal velocity. And this, we think, is a very clear hint that uh, uh, there's a triggering mechanism for the mass loss rate. And in total, we find variations in mass loss rate and uh, terminal velocity by more than a factor of three. So that is quite surprising. Also, very interesting, uh, when we compute from this wind model, we can compute a synthetic uh, light curve of the star. And this is shown in the top panel. Uh, we find that the light curve looks quite chaotic. Okay, okay, we cannot combine these points because there are no data available, but in total it looks quite chaotic. And we found an old data set of uh, photometric observations and when we compare that, it's even more chaotic. So the reality is even more chaotic than what we have found so far from our star. Um, and the other thing that we found is that no clear periodicity is seen in each alpha line profile. Although we thought in last year, in 2013, we were very lucky with the weather, so we could observe every night, almost, there are only a few gaps here, and you see how the alpha line changes every night. And then it's almost gone. And then it's, it's back, it's back. It's, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not periodic. Yeah, so we were hoping that now we have uh, the period of each alpha. No, completely not. But we were very lucky that in these first four nights and in these last three nights of this total of 25 nights, the conditions were so good that uh, we could take time series uh, all over the night. So we started to analyze basically the, the helium line because it's the strongest line in the spectrum, so we concentrated on that one. And we performed the, the moment method. We uh, computed the first and the third moment, and you see when you compare, they look they look the same, more or less the same. So this is strong indication, as I said, this star is pulsating. Uh, this is the 25-day period you see here. Within one night, the strong variability in radial velocity that you obtain. Here, it goes down and up again, and next night it's much more, much higher. 
Over the whole four years that we were observing, we have a schedule of about almost 25 kilometers per second variability in radial velocity. This is a zoom in of the first four nights that we observed. And since we have extremely good signal to noise, this is real. I mean, it's not noise or something. This is really real. The observing lengths per night were about six hours. And uh, very clearly, we see some short variability and on top of some longer periods. So we performed a um, period analysis, but let me first say that we also checked with the silicon line and the carbon line to, just to see whether all elements behave the same way. And yes, they do. So we are very, very sure that this is all due to causations. So we were searching for uh, frequencies. And uh, this is uh, what we find. We found a total of 19 different periods, different amplitude and phase shifts. And when we clean the amplitude spectrum, then this is only the noise that is left. And uh, then we compute how the radial velocity of these profiles look like over this 25-day period. And this is the black curve. You see there are about three points that don't fit to the curve because we use the all four-year uh, data. And maybe the star has changed, the positions have changed, we don't know. But still, we think that this is a very good fit. And when we look at the two time series, the fit to the data, I mean, this is just, to me, it looks excellent, but maybe I'm biased. Um, but what is so astonishing is how crazy the radial velocity of this line profile changes. Well, um, the amount of uh, pulsation periods that we found is only about half of what Sayo et al. found from their photometric data for another B supergiant. But when we look at the, the paper that what they computed in 2013 for stars with different initial masses, which is in the range of our star, and the ability of the star to perform pulsations along the main sequence and after the main sequence. This is shown here as the solid line. And you see along the main sequence and shortly after, the star has a lot of pulsation periods. But when we are at the position where our star is somewhere here, there is hardly any pulsation left. But when we follow the evolution back, after the red supergiant phase, the, when the star is evolving back, you see how many pulsation periods are predicted in this post red supergiant scenario. So that might be a very strong indicator that 55 Cygni is also in a post red supergiant phase with many, many different pulsation periods. And actually included here in the dots, you see they are for L equals zero, these uh, dots. Uh, these are radial uh, pulsations. And they might be identified with the so-called strange mode pulsations, these pulsations that can trigger the mass loss from the star. Now, to summarize uh, the work um, for HD 202850 Sigma Cygnus, um, we think that uh, the current mass that was uh, found from spectroscopy, the abundances, everything indicate that the star is a post-ray supergiant. It should have many more pulsation periods than what we found so far. So we have uh, three periods. One is uh, about 1.6 hours, which is extremely short and is not predicted by any theory so far. Two other are more specific. Well, I would not trust them at the moment. Uh, they need confirmation. And uh, actually, end of June and uh, beginning of July, we have another 14-day mission at uh, DIO in Canada. And at the same time, we try to get simultaneous observation in Andreov to combine the data sets to have the best possible coverage. Uh, and then we hope to be able to refine and find more position periods in that star. So we find positions and, uh, well, they are not predicted by theory, which is a surprise. Um, for 55 Cygni, we see night-to-night variability of H-alpha because, well, 
First of all, H alpha is also subject to positions. Its uh, photostrate line is uh, influenced by positions, but in addition, it has this wind, and this wind is also changing every day. So H alpha, it's not surprising that H alpha is uh, uh, worrying uh, in a crazy way, and that it produces, that the star has a very chaotic light curve. We found so far uh, uh, 19 periods from the radio velocity variations of its helium line, periods ranging from about 2.7 hours to 22.5 days. This is longer than was expected from regular G modes, and so we suspect also that some of these modes could be connected with strange mode positions that are triggering mass loss rate. Um, of course, the most ideal would be if we could have simultaneous spectroscopy in the UV, because the UV is much better in uh, uh, determining the wind parameters of stars, plus optical, plus photometry. Everything together, that would be a dream. Um, but what I can say is that uh, uh, if we are able to identify uh, the position modes and periods, then uh, we can have a lot of information about these type of stars, the internal structure, the evolutionary history, but this requires that a lot of work needs to be done, not only observationally, but also theoretically, because as we see here, observations and theory usually don't go hand in hand. But let me, uh, let me end with uh, some advertisement. There is a, a project planned, or it's already in a rather developed state. It's called UVMAC right now, but we are still looking for a better name for that. It's a new satellite mission. And this satellite will be extremely useful because uh, it will uh, obtain UV and optical data at the same time with a very high resolution, with a very uh, high stability. It's planned that many stars will be monitored for at least one month and uh, a lot of stars will be observed to determine uh, uh, wind variability or wind parameters, etc. It will also have uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, taking spectral polarimetric uh, observations. So it will be very useful for people studying magnetic stars and searching for magnetic fields. Right now, uh, we are preparing a proposal that should be submitted to ESA this fall. And if that will be approved, then uh, it will be uh, launched something in 2026, which seems to be very far in the future, but we have time to develop theory until then and be prepared. And if you are interested, there is uh, this web page and you can find all the information uh, available right now on this, uh, on this uh, mission. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, please, questions. Yeah, yeah. When you are observing, stars and uh, trying to find the pulsations. Can you uh, distinguish the pulsations between the effects that might be induced by a potential companion star or yes. a large planet? Is it easy to distinguish or do you have to observe and make sure there are no those companions? Right. No, you can very easily uh, distinguish that. Also, the question was, uh, is it possible to distinguish position from uh, surface inhomogeneities, which also have line profile variability? The answer is to both questions is yes, <clears throat> because with this moment analysis, when you have lines from different elements that show the same behavior, then it cannot be surface inhomogeneity, like in AP stars or something like that. And uh, if the first and the third moment are worrying exactly in phase, this is position. It's nothing else. So yeah, we are sure that these are real positions. And this is the difference between photometry and spectroscopy. From photometry, you cannot be so sure. But from spectroscopy, you have a very clear indicator. Yes, Arvind? What is the role of different quantum states, say, uh, excited and transitions from the ground state to the free or from excited, are there some specifically understandable features in this uh, uh, picture you have shown, how depending from the effective temperature, different 
such lines of different uh, pulsations are forming. And the, they're connected with some specific physical phenomena. Yes, they are connected to the presence and the location of the convective stones inside the star. It depends on where and what is the effective temperature of the star and where is the convective zone in the star. And then you get different kind of pulsations that are excited or no pulsations at all. So my question is about this title, that is, pulsations are triggering mass loss, mm -hmm. how it's concretely the, the triggered, that is, whether these pulsations are giving initial velocity or mass flow and then this the line dri driving mechanism takes it over and starts mass this loss. This is the idea. Oh, but in this way, I suppose that pulsations can do only this shell ejections. That is, one shell is ejected, then it's empty space, and after some time, you have another shell, such kind of structure of the wind, I suppose. Yes, yes, what we think, but there is so far no proof for that. Um, maybe you know about uh, the literature that talks about uh, clumps formation of clumps in stellar winds. And so far, it was only investigated what can, grow, what can cause instabilities in a wind. So people just put some perturbance on the stellar surface to the base of the wind, and suddenly they found uh, strong instabilities taking place. But what is giving the disturbance was never discussed. So I think that this disturbance is caused by pulsations. You are right, it will not be uh, a smooth wind, that it enhances the wind in a very smooth way. It will be more like eruptions, shell phases, although with shells I'm also careful because you see that the star... Um, when you have... Here, these different motions on the surface. So everything that is blue is going out. Everything that is red is going in. Now imagine that at some phase, they, you have this, this is only one mode. Now you have to imagine that you have the interplay between 19 different modes. They all look something like that or even worse. And then you see that from only very specific surface regions, you will lift the material. It's not even a shell. It's something like very chaotic, or maybe not chaotic because it's, it's ordered. But if these position modes uh, interfere in a constructive way at some parts on the stellar surface, it can lift the material further up than in other parts. And if then the line driving takes over, you will have an enhanced or you will form clumps or inhomogeneities or things like that. Yeah, the question is, I mean, I don't know if I can make the remark that uh, what is uh, studied was uh, the classical pulsation method is, of course, nonlinear, uh, a lot linear pulsation, so you have uh, linear dynamics. But the question is, if the uh, amplitude is uh, stronger than uh, usual for in linear dynamics, you don't have simple pulsations, you have really then uh, nonlinear pulsations and uh, they can lead maybe to some kind of uh, they can lead to some chaotic chaotic uh, emotions which yes. uh, can then uh, lead to let's say not decaying modes but uh, to, to the to over stability or, or instabilities which can maybe drive in this kind of uh, mass ejections and, uh, Question in my own. Yeah. Uh, could it be if it is like that one, two, three, fourth picture there, then just little clumps leave surface? Not it is not like a shell is leaving the surface, but clump here, clump there, yes. clump here, clump there. Yes. Something like that. Yes. 
then then we wouldn't see any uh, any shell structure in no. the yeah it will be just a very clumpy wing yeah and actually i mean i could not talk about too much details but but our investigations it's it's still in progress we haven't uh, submitted yet but uh, what we find is really we have a stable phase some days six days and then suddenly muscles jumps up for no obvious reason and then it goes down or even further down so it's uh, very very chaotic yeah. have i understood you right if from this picture uh, of uh, different quantum numbers one can uh, namely find the inner structure of stars that would be the ultimate goal yes it is very easy if a star has only one position mode maybe an overtone that's like a multi-configurational yes. approach in quantum yes. mechanics yes Yes, it will be highly complicated. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to find so many frequencies in that star. So that is just, uh, I don't know how, how this star will look like. I, I cannot predict right now how this star is really pulsating. But you have seen the variation in radial velocity of the line is, uh, is very chaotic. <coughs> Questions? Yeah? I, I'm not a stellar physicist. So. <laughs> yeah. okay, about this uh, multiple periods we found that, um, um, are they physically feasible or maybe the star is really chaotic where some uh, sort of episodes are happening and then a line goes to quasi-periodic behavior you can observe that these uh, episodes happen in a chaotic way. Nobody yeah. knows how long-lived position codes and modes are. We don't know. It could be chaotic. That's, I think, maybe also one reason why we could not uh, fit the radio velocity curve perfectly. There were dots that were just off. It could be that some modes are stable over, let's say, two years only, or one year, and then they disappear in another mode with a similar frequency, but maybe different amplitude uh, sets in. Really, nobody knows. This is, uh, there are only very few people right now working on that uh, subject, and it's very, very complicated. But feel welcome to help. <laughs> and also, can you tell me what is the general evolutionary time scale? Uh, but start at this stage, how many millions of years? Oh, um, fast stage or still one? It is relatively fast compared to the main sequence evolution, of course, but compared to the positions, it is negligible. But this uh, mass loss of nearly half of the mass, no, yeah, half of the mass, uh, what was the time scale? No, the mass loss happens when the star is in the red supershine, in the very cool edge okay. of the evolution. In that stage, it loses a lot of mass, and then it evolves back. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. More questions? Yeah. Have you proposed any observational programs for those uh, existing uh, small photometric satellites? No. Right, most? We, we try to get, well, most is dead. And not the satellite, but the project. The Canadians decided not to put any more money into that, so it will be switched off, unfortunately. I heard that two weeks ago. That is very, very sad. Corot, I think, is also out of order now. Um, Bright is a possibility. Um, I'm in contact with people working or being uh, directly involved in Bright. They have observed, uh, or they started recently to really observe. They have observed one field in Orion. Um, there are data available which are quite nice, but they still belong to the PI of uh, each star. I'll try to get data in collaboration with people there, but uh, and try to get involved to present my own targets that should be observed, if possible. Uh, but ground-based, uh, I have so far nothing 
But that would be excellent. I have a lot of data. Well, <laughs> <laughs> not processed yet. Well, not properly processed yet. Mm -hmm. There are some fine tuning effects mm -hmm. uh, to be taken into account. I've also taken, I think in the same period that you observed, yes. I also observed new yes. spectroscopic and I did not produce them, originally produced them yet. But that would be ideal to have uh, the same time photometric and uh, spectroscopic observations. That would be excellent. So as I understand, the, the both sets of observations are well on hand, but progress. they are not. Uh, <laughs> but they are not processed. No, they are yes. not processed yet. I, I got those preliminary ones, and I, mm -hmm. I also sent those. But uh, be, uh, because the the stars are. Yeah, for spectroscopy, it's yeah. good to have bright star, but for photometry, it's. Uh, it's it's not a nice thing to have yes. uh, at, at the moment. Even this 30 centimeter telescope is too big to mm -hmm. uh, have long enough exposure times. Mm -hmm. So they are extremely short, mm -hmm. even below one second. <clears throat> and uh, all the atmospheric uh, scintillation effects and this uh, shutter effect is at the moment the most uh, significant uh, mm -hmm. instrumental effect. I have to take care. Still. So we have. We have a work to do. Yeah. And Arvid had a question here. Yeah. What is the difference if a star is rotating pole on or equator on for a, our observers? Is a, this picture very different observer yes. or not? Yes, yes, it has influence of... Uh, Can it be program. also the inclination be found from these studies? That's a problem. It is a problem, yes. Actually, um, inclination angle, rotation velocity of stars, I did not talk about that at all, but we have serious problems in finding V sin i values of these type of stars. It is usually people, the modern way to analyze uh, line profiles is to perform Fourier analysis. Then you obtain a zero point, and this zero point gives you exactly the V sin i of the star. I did that for that star, and from every single spectrum, I obtained a different value. So it seems that the positions are somehow influencing these line profiles in a way that uh, they modify the result of uh, the Fourier transform. It is uh, not solved yet. So I have range from zero to 60 kilometers per second in V sin i for that star. It's not a problem of inclination. First, let's try to figure out what is the an eye of the star. <laughs> okay, more questions? If there is... Ah. I, I have one okay. question, just... Uh, where's the... Uh, is is uh, some of such stars uh, studied uh, interferometrically? Uh, there was... Yes, there was a recent paper by Olivier Chanot, but he studied, it was cooler, it was a bit cooler that star. Um, to see directly uh, the variability in H alpha in the very deep inner, the wind region. It is possible using the Shara interferometer, because this is an optical interferometer, but the star has to be bright and close, close by else interferometry will not be able to resolve especially the structure of the wind and also the shape of the star. There has been some attempts. There was one star observed with interferometry and they found that it's rapidly rotating and because the surface looked very flattened. Yeah, but these stars have to be very bright and very close by. Well, more questions? So, yeah. Have you can you make some comparison of the same type of stars? You said that all very similar stars, one of which is almost not pulsating and one is, another is pulsating. Mm -hmm. And what is difference in mass loss rates such stars? P no, it's not the difference in mass loss rate. It is uh, the difference in the evolutionary state. So one star is, maybe I can go back. <coughs> Uh, this plot you mean? We have here 
the different evolution. We have here the evolution, main sequence, and just beyond main sequence. It's the same uh, stellar model. Uh, and when the star is just beyond the main sequence, it has very little position modes. But if the star evolves back from the red supergiant stage and reaches the same temperature, so from just looking at the star, you cannot distinguish in which direction it evolves, but from looking at the position, the presence of positions, it should be possible to identify this star as evolving redward and the other star as evolving blueward. Did I understand your question correctly? No. My question is, uh, that is, if mass loss rates for this nearly the same spectral type stars mm -hmm. are nearly the same, and one star is pulsating, another is not pulsating, then this is, mass loss is not triggered by pulsations. I can conclude. That. Ah, but we don't have so much statistics yet. Yes. Okay. yes. We cannot say anything about that at the moment. More questions? Indeed, actually, all supergiants are variable. Variable, of course, but <laughs> most of them are variable due to wind variations. So you are not seeing the Photometrically, yes, I think. I mean. Yes, but what it depends on the mass loss rate. If the mass loss rate is very high, then you are not seeing these stellar layers at all. You are seeing only it's blue. only for numerous blue variables and, and uh, no, hypergiants, for, 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 ordinary, for ordinary supergiants. For all Wolfram stars. Is oh, Wolfram is, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are it's different. Yes. That you cannot but, even but see the normal, surface. Normal supergiants are, uh, have uh, optically thin mm -hmm. stellar winds. So photospheric lines the, are seen. Yeah. 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 Of course, yeah, right. One more question. Which, has, which is a role of micro turbulence? Is connected with this problem of pulsations or doesn't play any role? Um, or it is not clear? The, I think the micro turbulence is not critical. The micro turbulence, not. The macro, macro turbulence, which is not a turbulence at all. Uh, this is the important thing. Uh, the micro turbulence, no. But something I intermediary? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you need to invent no, one no, more no. free parameter for a code and call it intermediate. <laughs> intermediate turbulence. No, but the macro turbulence, what is called in the literature macro turbulence, is not at all connected to any turbulent motion. The people had no idea what it is, what makes these lines so broad and makes them look like Gaussian profiles rather than these round shaped rotation, rotation profiles. So they called it macro turbulence. But the amount, the velocity connected is uh, highly supersonic. And it cannot be true that this is turbulence because then you would have shocks in the wind and shocks create X-ray emission and this is all not observed. So it's not a turbulence. Actually, what is uh, thought is that all the many, many pulsations uh, that overlap each other and have an influence on that line profile, at the end, they just mirror sort of a Gaussian profile that you can, that is used. People convolve the spectra with an extra Gaussian profile with this macro turbulent width to represent uh, the real shape of the line profiles. But this is uh, artificial and is caused by, by the positions. Or something else? Who knows? Okay, more questions? Don't see any more questions. Oh, no, one more. Yeah. What are those uh, HD9 and others? I'm those sorry. Crosses? Uh, these are uh, um, stars, uh, so called. Alpha Cygni variables. This paper has been dealing with these Alpha Cygni variables and they are known uh, periods and the amount of periods that were found in these stars to show that these stars are all post red supergiant stars. They show so many different uh, periodicities that uh, the, the aim of this paper was to prove that these stars are all in post red supergiant evolutionary state. These are just the positions of uh, these stars in the HR diagram, and this is 
uh, their periods, their observed periods, the range of periods. Who else is brave? <laughs> okay, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. And on Monday we have a meeting uh, of Stellar Group. Of course, everyone is welcome to come to listen. And uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, Dieter Nikolaer will be presenting a talk on uh, hydro magneto hydrodynamics of astro what? Astrospheres. Astros astrophy. <coughs> Sorry. Astrospheres. <laughs> Astrospheres. I mean, this is wind. a bubble uh, around the star of wind, which moves through the in, uh, interstellar uh, medium. So, this thing. The Estonian astrosphere. Oh, good. Peter, you heard a new word.